All right, so last time we left off, uh, we went through all the blessings. Uh, this is just a chart, chart that I grabbed online, so uh, this is not a Bible-believing chart, so you'll notice some uh, modern Bible version charts, so just ignore that part, all right? Just look at the pictures, because it looks nice, okay? So <laughs> in the picture right here, we're covering now Joseph and Benjamin. So Joseph is uh, likened to a fruitful bough, and that's what uh, Jacob gave the blessing towards Joseph. So let's look at the book of Genesis chapter 49, and then we'll look at verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. So uh, it's pretty much self-explanatory, Joseph. He's going to be like a fruitful bough or a vine. Lots of fruit coming out, even one that runs by a well. The branches are extending all over the wall. So remember, I'm going to be explaining pretty much each and every word from the verse because that's the uh, bottom line of verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. So if there's something that I might sound redundant, uh, just ignore that part. Just look at the verse and see if every way or every word that I explain matches up with that verse, all right? Because that's the point of this Bible study. Now, Joseph undoubtedly is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we see that in John 15. Go to John 15. All right. So uh, I might go a little bit over time today, but I'll try not to because I'm going to finish Genesis now. All right. So this will be our last Genesis study. Who would have thunk, right? All right. John 15. We see right here Joseph is likened to Jesus Christ as a fruitful bough or vine. The Bible says at verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Uh, verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Uh, we see uh, another example. We'll go to Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. There is no doubt that Joseph is a fruitful bough. No doubt about it. And we see this fulfilled at Deuteronomy 33. And then we'll look at verse 17. Deuteronomy 33. And then we'll look at verse 17. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 33, and then we'll look at verse 17. We'll notice right here uh, concerning the prophecy about Joseph. We can start off at verse 13, Deuteronomy 33, 13. And of Joseph, he said, blessed, be, blessed of the Lord be his land for the precious things of heaven, for the dew and for the deep that couches beneath. And for, notice right here, the precious fruits brought forth by the sun and for the precious things put forth by the moon. So uh, verse 16, and for the precious things of the earth and fullness thereof, and for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush, let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph. Uh, verse 17, his glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them shall he push the people together uh, to the ends of the earth. We see right here that Joseph is likened as, some, as a fruitful nation. We go, uh, returning back to Genesis 49, 23. Genesis 49, 23. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. So Joseph has enemies and they are bowmen. They're archers. They sorely grieved him. So they hurt him intensely. They shot at him, and they also hated him. Verse 24, but his, bow, but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is a shepherd, the stone of Israel. Uh, however, Joseph was able to withstand it. His bow uh, lasted, it stayed, it remained in strength. Uh, the arms 
of his hands. They were strong by the hands of the almighty God of Jacob, who was supporting and helping him. So Joseph uh, is also uh, that bowman who was able to fight back against the archers. Now, there are historical references, and there are also uh, prophetic references to this passage. Uh, we're going to look at Judges 5, Judges 5, and Psalm 60. We're going to turn to Judges 5 and then also uh, Psalm, the book of Psalm 60. So we see that uh, within Joseph's nation that he was able, uh, that he was undergoing attacks by archers, but he, through the strength of the hands of the Almighty God, he was able to fight back. All right, Judges chapter 5, we'll look at verse 11. The Bible says, They that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down uh, to the gates. So this is a song from uh, Deborah where... Uh, they were able to sing about God delivering them uh, from the archers, and they were able to fight back. Uh, look at Psalm 60, verse 7. Psalm 60, verse 7. The Bible says, Gilead is mine, and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is a strength of mine head. Judah is my lawgiver. So notice right here that uh, Ephraim, and we know that Ephraim, he comes from uh, Joseph's family, that he is the strength of my, hen, my head. Remember, God was giving strength to Joseph's family lineage, so he strengthened him. The last one is Zechariah 10, Zechariah chapter 10. So Joseph has been known to be a nation where even though the enemy sorely hurt him, he was able to conquer and fight back. Let's look at book of Zechariah chapter 10. We'll look at verse 6, verse 6. The word of God reads, and this is actually tribulation reference, and I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them again to place them, for I have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off, for I am the Lord their God, and will hear them. Okay, so we see right here uh, historical references, but we also have seen, um, oops, excuse me, uh, my mind's not there. Uh, historical references, but we've all, oh, come on now. What are you doing? Okay, don't do this to me. All right, so we've seen right here that uh, references, references to historically where Joseph was hit sore by his enemies or described as archers, but they have been known to be a people where God has given them strength and they were able to conquer. So we've seen that historically, but we've also, we're also going to, well, I put this at eraser mode, excuse me. But we've also are seeing something from Zechariah that Joseph's lineage, he was able to do that in the tribulation as well. He's able to do that in the tribulation. So then, Joseph, he is going to be hit by archers during the tribulation timeline. Then we have to think about uh, what is that archer that sorely grieves Joseph during the tribulation timeline. You go to Revelation 6. That's the only place you can think about Revelation chapter 6. So then the historical application we have seen where he was able to conquer his enemies, so the Old Testament enemies. But then we see a prophetic reference which has to do with the Antichrist. So the Antichrist, the Bible describes him to be the bowman, the archer. So he's going to try to persecute Joseph or the nation of Israel. 
the Antichrist. All right, there we go. We get to Revelation chapter 6. Notice that the first seal is described about the Antichrist where he comes out. And we do know that the Antichrist, he will persecute the nation of Israel. So Joseph is included in there. But he's able to overcome the Antichrist at the end where we saw in Zechariah chapter 10. The Bible says that Revelation 6, 2, And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. See that? So that's a bowman right there. And the crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. All right, going back to Genesis 49. Going back to Genesis 49. We see right here that uh, the nation of Israel, or particularly Joseph's tribe, that he gets persecuted during the Old Testament by his enemies, as well as the tribulation by the Antichrist. But because of the Almighty God, his hands, that he's able to conquer them. Now we see right here, this is very interesting, another passage in reference proving that Jesus is Jehovah God in the Old Testament. So what you see right here concerning Joseph's lineage is that, notice it says God from thence is what? The stone as well as the shepherd. Yeah. Why, you know that passage. Uh, who's the stone? Who's the shepherd? Uh, go to John 10 and then go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2 and John 10. Why the stone and shepherd we know to be Jesus Christ. So this is proof that Jesus is Jehovah God. Notice in the Old Testament we've seen that. The Old Testament, uh, it's amazing. That book of Genesis, the first book, Beginning of Beginnings, we've already seen several cases where Jesus has to be God. All right, let's start off with uh, John chapter 10. Notice that at verse 1, Jesus declared himself to be uh, the good shepherd laying down his life for the sheep. Uh, but let's do verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and have known of mine. All right, First Peter 2. First Peter 2. Uh, the Bible points out Jesus Christ is the stone at verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. All right, let's go back to Genesis 49. Genesis 49. All right, verse 25. We left off at verse 25. Even by the God of thy father who shall help thee, <clears throat> and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above and blessings of the deep that lieth under. Okay, so uh, Jacob is continuing on his blessings for Joseph. He says that, uh, he talks about the mighty God of Jacob at verse 24, and he says, even by the God of thy father. So uh, I'm talking about the God of your father who will help you. And by the Almighty, that's his title, he's going to help Joseph. He's going to bless you with blessings of heaven from above, so good weather, blessings of the deep that lieth under, so rich, fertile earth, so good crops, blessings of the breast and of the womb. So that's referring to blessings of fruition from his family lineage. Verse 26, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors, unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. Okay, so we can see a lot of figure of speech language here. He's saying that the blessings of your father, Jacob, have prevailed, have been greater uh, than the blessings of his uh, forefather, my progenitors, the people before him. And this blessing is so great that it reaches to the utmost bound, the furthest reach, uh, the longest uh, hills that would ever last. <laughs> so that's the idea, the figure of speech. So Joseph, basically, Joseph's blessing is huge then. 
He received that from his father. Uh, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. So Jacob says that these blessings will fall upon Joseph's head and fall upon the crown of his head where he was separated from his brethren. So we see right here that uh, Jacob says that uh, Joseph was separated from his brethren, meaning then Jacob knew. Jacob found out that uh, Joseph's brothers uh, sold him as a slave into Egypt, and he ended up there. Because I'm sure Jacob, he was wondering, how did he end up there? Well, uh, Dad, um, so you could probably imagine that one. I don't know. But we do know that Jacob, he did find out later on that uh, Joseph, uh, he was separated from his brothers. Uh, verse 27. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. All right, so now we cover uh, the next blessing. Uh, over here we cover uh, Benjamin's case. Oh, oh to joy. Okay, that don't look good. Is it this one? Oh, I was afraid that wouldn't work. Sometimes when you switch back and forth, this thing, won't, this thing misbehaves. All right, anyway, uh, so Benj we cover the next blessing, and that is Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin, he is uh, likened to the wolf. I'm going to get a different line for this guy. So Benjamin, he is uh, likened to the wolf right here. So he's a, a, ra he's a ravenous wolf, so to speak. He's going to... Uh, conquer his enemies, get the spoil for himself. Uh, verse 27, the morning, he's going to devour uh, his prey, uh, his food, and then nighttime, he's going to be able to divide our, uh, the spoil amongst himself, amongst his people. So that's pretty much self-explanatory. Verse 28, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's a summary of all the 12 tribes of Israel. Benjamin's case, we definitely seen that he is a uh, ravenous wolf. I mean, he was a brutal tribe, actually. A lot, uh, a lot of people had a hard time conquering him. Go to Judges 20. Judges 20. Benjamin has a history, believe it or not, where... He himself, one tribe, was able to conquer all of his other brethren, the remaining tribes, believe it or not. No, Benjamin was a fierce tribe. We'll go to uh, Judges chapter 20. Judges chapter 20. Notice right here, verse 15. And the children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities, 20 and 6,000 men that drew sword. Uh, verse 17, and the men of Israel beside Benjamin were numbered 400,000 men that uh, drew sword. All these were men of war. Okay, 400,000 men versus 26,000 men. Okay, look at this. This is crazy. Then we look at verse 18. And the children of Israel rose and went up to the house of God uh, and asked counsel of God, which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And notice that the Benjamites uh, whooped the Jews. Uh, verse 21. And uh, verse 21. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day 20 and 2,000 men. That's a lot of work. Benjamin is a fierce tribe. Yeah, here are several names to think about. Ehud is from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a left-handed guy. Saul of Tarsus, uh, the apostle Paul, was from Benjamin. King Saul, uh, the first king in Israel, was also from uh, the tribe of Benjamin. Some interesting notions about Paul. Uh, let's look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, some interesting notions about Benjamin. 
we know that he is a fierce tribe uh, that no one should mess around with. We see that uh, Ehud is from his tribe. Benjamin has been known to be slingers, left-handed slingers, actually. So not David. It wasn't supposed to be David's tribe. It was the Benjamites. Uh, but the Lord humbled uh, the Benjamite tribe through David. But that's another story. Anyway, in Benjamin, we've seen that uh, there are a fierce group of people. Ehud comes from there. We see uh, the apostle Paul comes from there as well as King Saul. So, the Apostle Paul, it is interesting that he talks a lot about Christian warfare, but he has no history of being military or being a soldier. So, which stands to, uh, which stands to show that uh, his tribe is known to be strong, military, mindset. So that's important to keep in mind about uh, the Benjamites. They always had that history of being soldiers, kind of like Spartans, so to speak. Like the second Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Another one uh, that uh, you can look at is the book of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and then verse 3. We see right here that uh, Paul makes a very big deal about war, about being a soldier, even though he had no military background. But it's because of his tribe. 2 Timothy 2 3, Thou therefore in your hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So Paul, even though he was not a soldier, he had a military mindset, and it could be explained because of his tribe. He mentioned about the whole armor of God at Ephesians 6, right? Yeah. So we won't turn over there, but... There's no doubt that the Apostle Paul, he had a military mindset. Amen. Okay, uh, returning back to Genesis 49. Returning back to Genesis 49. Now we wrap up the blessings of the 12 tribes of Israel, verse 28. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is it, that their father spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. So, uh, in uh, meaning that these are all the 12 tribes of Israel, this is it. Everything that Jacob gave to them, that uh, their father spoke about them, he blessed them. And he made sure that as he blessed them, it matched everyone according to his blessing that he blessed them. Now, um, there is uh, one question about that line, that when Jacob blessed them, he blessed them everyone according to their blessing. Because if you recall, when we go back uh, to uh, Reuben and Simeon and Levi, they didn't really get a blessing, right? They got more so of a uh, curse, if you might recall. Uh, Reuben was unstable as water, Simeon and Levi, Jacob specifically said, cursed be their anger. So it didn't really sound like a blessing. So then what does that mean that he blessed them accordingly to each, uh, each group, uh, each person a blessing? It could mean, uh, it could be just a simplistic term that generally this is known as the blessings of Jacob chapter, right? So it could be a simplistic term that way. Or it, another meaning could be, which I don't think is the right meaning, but it could be possible, is that when God, uh, well, not uh, sometimes the Lord does this, but sometimes when blessings are uh, given to each person, it can in, be inclusive of curses. So in other words, when a curse is given to somebody, it could also be a blessing in disguise, if that makes any sense. 
Now, there are some passages in the scriptures. Uh, I think Genesis 3 is a great example. In Genesis 3, the Lord gave the curse upon mankind. Uh, one example, uh, I'll be preaching out of that today, believe it or not, but he says, in the sweat of your face, uh, you're going to have to uh, bring forth bread. Uh, let's go to Genesis 3. Genesis 3. So let's take a look at that one real quick. So that is supposed to be a curse. However, believe it or not, sweat is good for you. Sweat is more of a blessing in disguise because sweat is supposed to cool down your body. If you had no sweat, then, then your muscles are burning and then your internal temperature would be rising, would not be in good shape. So a lot of times when the Lord gives you a curse, a lot of times it could be a blessing in disguise. In Genesis 3, uh, notice right here in verse 19, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. So we would take that as a curse given, but believe it or not, that's a good thing for you. Another example is Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Chastening of the Lord, correct? Chastisement is not a blessing. Chastisement is more what you would consider it to be a curse. But believe it or not, it's a blessing in disguise because it shows that you're his child. He cares for you. It's done so that you can produce fruit. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. Verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceful fruit of righteousness. All right, going back to Genesis 49. Now we look at verse 29. Verse 29. And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. In the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. Okay, uh, meaning, okay, so see if every explanation I give will match word for word which with the, verse, uh, with the words in these verses. So Jacob, he charges them. He gives them a charge. He says to them that I want to be gathered uh, with my people. So he's going to be gathered with his forefathers in the burying place. So he wants to be buried there. So he asked to bury him with his forefathers in that cave. You might recall that's where his forefathers are buried. This cave was in the field of Ephron the Hittite. It's the cave that's in the field of Machpelah. And this is before uh, the presence of Mamre. This is within the vicinity of Mamre. It's within the country of the land of Canaan. And that's where Abraham bought the field from Ephron the Hittite. And he was able to buy it as his own possession for a burying place, for a burial site. So it was in that spot in that cave that they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. They also buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And Jacob recognized that that's where I'm going to be buried with Leah, my wife. This field that was purchased and this cave that's, there, uh, that's over in there is all from the children of Heth that they purchased from. If there's one thing that we uh, notice about uh, Jacob's life is that he recognized that it's not, he's not going to be buried uh, with Leah. He decided to be, uh, be uh, excuse me, uh, he, uh, J Jacob wanted to be buried with Rachel. That would be the obvious thing in our minds because Rachel was his favorite. But now he decides to be buried with Leah. Change of pace right here. So perhaps because of Genesis 49, where he's supposed to recognize the legitimate heir and how it's supposed to work, he recognizes that uh, uh, Leah, be being the firstborn, that the right should go to her. So because of the blessings of Genesis 49, where he's recognizing the rights uh, of his family, that could be the reason why. Or it could also be uh, that Jacob 
throughout his time over there, the Lord started to soften his heart, open his eyes bit by bit. I mean, we do know that uh, Jacob went through a lot. The Lord had to teach him a lot of lessons. So it was during that time that he realized that where he should be buried is where his forefathers are buried. So uh, whatever the reason, he realizes that he should be buried with Leah, which is the right thing, which is the good thing. So he should be buried with Leah, not Rachel. Uh, this is the map, what we see right here, where uh, a courtesy of the Watchtower Society, so thank them for this map, actually. <laughs> they had the best map. I try to look everywhere, all right? <laughs> There's no King James only Bible believing website that would have a map, so, okay. All right, but anyway, so we see right here that Jacob, he made the trip to Egypt. He makes a trip to Egypt, but he's going to be buried, and Hebron is that area right here. So it's around this uh, domain. It's around this domain that he gets buried. So Jacob, uh, he dies. He returns uh, to where his forefathers are buried at verse 33. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. Uh, Self-explanatory, when Jacob finished uh, his commandment, toward his boys, he uh, put his feet up into the bed, so he's laying down, he's preparing to die, and then he gave up the ghost, that's a figure of speech meaning that he died, and then he was gathered to his people. All right, so he's, uh, he's going to be uh, noticed right here and was gathered unto his people, meaning that he was able to join his forefathers. So if he was able to join his forefathers when he was gathered to his people, because he was not buried yet at chapter 50, right? So they're working on his burying, uh, burial place. So what does that mean, he was gathered to his people? So he was, so it debunks soul sleep, see that? So it points out right here he was able to join his forefathers in the afterlife. That's the idea, in the underworld. Okay, so in chapter 50, verse 1, here we go. Let's see how much we can cover. And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. And 40 days were fulfilled for him. For so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. All right, self-explanatory. Here we go. I'll explain every word. Joseph, he falls upon his father's face. He uh, cried uh, over his father's uh, dead body, and then he gave him a kiss as well. He commanded his servants, who are doctors, to embalm his father, because that's an Egyptian custom and practice. So they do the bombing. That way they can preserve the body. So then the doctors, they embalmed, they wrapped up, they mummified basically Israel's uh, body or <laughs> Jacob's body. <coughs> So notice that 40 days were completed for Jacob because that's uh, the completion process of those days who are mummified, or another word for being embalmed. The Egyptians, they cried for him about 70 days. Now, I found this article, which was kind of interesting, where it takes about uh, 70 days. This is from the Egyptian Gazette. Uh, Gazette. But then they pointed out some uh, interesting wordings right here. They say right here that, um, uh, well, well, it's very different when I'm, okay. So he said that, uh, man, I saw 40 days here. Where, where did you go? Okay. Top? Oh, okay, thank you. So then right here, he says that the ritual will last for 40 days. The whole body is soaked in natron salt to absorb all body moisture and bacteria. Then he says that the, there's a last ritual that would go 15 days. But then in totality, they point out right here uh, that it'll be, they have right here, the first took 15 days. So right here. First took 15 days, uh, starting by laying the deceased on a bed, removing his clothing and purifying his body with water. Okay, so we can see the embalming process starting with Jacob, right? 
Then they continue on with uh, the next ritual, which goes 40 days, which I explained to you before. Then the last ritual, which is 15 days. Uh, they say that the mummy was put inside the coffin and presented to the family of the deceased. Okay. Oh, the joy of using a screen, right? It's easier showing you the articles, isn't it? Okay. So we see right here that Jacob, he went through a mummification process where he was buried. He was doing an Egyptian style. But he did not want to be buried in Egypt, remember. He wanted to be buried in his homeland. All right, when we are to look at verse uh, 4, verse 4. And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die in my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan. There shalt thou bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father, according as he made thee swear. Okay, explaining every word from the passage. So in verse 4, when the days of mourning were all said and done, Joseph now speaks to Pharaoh's household. So it's not just Pharaoh himself, it's his household. The elders are involved here. He says, to, uh, he asks for their permission. He says, if I found grace in your eyes, so if there's something that I've done that pleased you, if I can find grace with you, uh, speak, I beseech you, I beg you that you would give the word to the ears of Pharaoh himself. So then these elders in the house of Pharaoh are supposed to relay the message to uh, Pharaoh's ears. And they will tell him, Joseph asks them to tell him that my father made me promise where he said, hey, so low means uh, like pay attention to this part or hey, that's the idea. Hey, I'm about to pass away uh, in my grave. Uh, I made sure that I prepared, I dig for me, that's the idea, in the land of Canaan where you're going to bury me. I prepared a burial place for me there. So please let, let me go up. So remember, Egypt um, is down and Canaan is up. So he's saying, let me go up. That's the idea here, okay? So he's supposed to go up. Let me go up. Uh, let's see right here. I beseech you and uh, bury my father there in Canaan, and I'll return to Egypt again. So Pharaoh grants him permission. He says, go up. All right, go upwards to Canaan. Go ahead, bury your father uh, as he made you promise. Verse 7, and Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the elders, uh, with, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house. So uh, that the elders of his house proves that when Joseph spoke to the house of Pharaoh at verse 4, that's whom he was speaking to, okay? Continuing on, the elders of his house and all the elders of the land of Egypt. And all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. All right, so explaining every word here, so starting at verse 7, Joseph, he went up to Canaan to bury his father. Along with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of Pharaoh's household, and the elders throughout the land of Egypt. So all the house of Joseph and his brothers and his father's household went up as well to Canaan. But their children and then their uh, livestock, they left in the land of Goshen. So they left uh, their children and then their livestock behind in Goshen, while the remainder of them went up to make the trip over here uh, to the area of Hebron, somewhere around here, to bury his father. All right, continuing onwards. Uh, verse 9, pretty much self-explanatory. Who went along up with Joseph were a lot of chariots and horsemen. It was a huge number of people, very great company. Verse 10, and they came to the threshing floor of Atad which is beyond Jordan. And there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. And his sons uh, did unto him according as he commanded them, 
for his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with the field for a possession of a burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. Okay, um, it's pretty much self-explanatory about those verses uh, that I read to you, but I'll explain them to you. The idea is, starting at uh, verse 10, they, were, they arrived to the place, uh, a threshing floor, an uh, individual named Atad, and his, his place was beyond Jordan. Now, uh, Dr. Rutman mentions this part, so when we look at the, uh, the Jordan River here, which is beyond Jordan, majority of commentators will put that over here, so past Jordan, around here. But uh, if Hebron's around this terrain, uh, when, we, when we look up the verse beyond Jordan, it doesn't have to be uh, past this Jordan River here. Beyond Jordan can also pass the Jordan River in this side as well, Dr. Upman mentions. So which makes a lot of sense. Some commentators will say that it's the eastward terrain of Jordan. Uh, where it occurred, but Dr. Upman says it can also include westward of Jordan. It can also include westward of Jordan when you look up the, uh, the phrase beyond Jordan. So uh, he, here is uh, one verse that we can look at that can demonstrate this. Uh, we're going to turn to Joshua chapter 13. <coughs> uh, Deuteronomy 3, excuse me. We're going to turn to Deuteronomy 3. Now, Moses is the author of Genesis, right? And notice that this same author in Deuteronomy recognizes that uh, west of the river would also be the same reference to beyond Jordan. We're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 3, and then we'll look at verse 25, 25. I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain in Lebanon. But uh, when Moses gave this request to the Lord, this was referring to the west of the river Jordan, west of the river Jordan. So this is one example here. All right, uh, going back to our main text. Going back to our main text, continuing on. Verse 10, explaining every word. The idea is that uh, they, they were probably around the west part of Jordan at a threshing floor of Atad, and there they uh, wept, mourned for him with a great and very sore, very strong uh, weeping. Uh, they mourned for him, Jacob, seven days. Uh, the dwellers of the, the land of Canaan, the Canaanites, they saw that mourning at the, at the threshing floor of Atad, and the Canaanites said, man, this is a very uh, heavy mourning for the Egyptians. So then they gave it a name, uh, and they called it Abel Mizraim. And they put that name, Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan, or the west side uh, of the Jordan River. Continuing onwards... So then, uh, verse 12, the sons of Jacob followed the commandment uh, of their father because the sons, they carried the body of their uh, father to the land of Canaan, buried him in the cave, which is the field of Machpelah, where Abraham bought the field as his own possession, as a burial site from Ephron the Hittite, and that's located within the region of Mamre. Okay. Continuing onwards now, verse 14. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father, after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall he say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. All right, so we can, uh, summing up, verse 14 through 17, Joseph, uh, he returns to Egypt, he and his brothers, 
and everyone that went along with him to bury his father. After they finished burying his father, they went back home. Verse 15, once Joseph's brothers saw that their father died, it just clicked on them. Oh my goodness, Joseph will possibly hate us. He's going to certainly pay us back everything for all the bad stuff that we did to him. Verse 16, so they send a messenger to Joseph, you know, because they're so scared, you know. They don't want to see him face to face. So. And this messenger says to Joseph, your father did command right before he passed away. And he said, makes you wonder if that really happened or not, you know. But, but anyway, uh, one thing I know about this family tree is that they're always liars and they're always deceivers and they're always sneaky people, all right? Uh, that's one thing you learn from this family tree, okay? Verse 17, please uh, say to Joseph, hey, please, uh, I beg you, uh, forgive the evil, the sins of your brothers uh, for all the evil that they did to you. They did, what they did to you was wrong. So now we beseech you, we pray thee, so I beg that you'll forgive the sin of the, servant, uh, the servants of the God of thy father, your servants, the servants of your God. Now Joseph responds in, uh, this is an amazing thing, and I find this very difficult to do. No, uh, this is uh, one of the things that will be helpful for you during bitterness is to check your heart on this one. Right. Notice the next part that it says Joseph wept bitterly. You see that there? A total unselfishness right here. Notice right here, and Joseph wept when they spake unto him. So Joseph, he cried when they told him that to uh, please, you know, forgive us. What we did to you was wrong. And then don't, uh, don't, uh, uh, don't pay us back with evil. Verse 18, and his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, behold, we be thy servants. So his brothers, they go to Joseph. They fall down on their faces before him. And they say, uh, behold, look, we're your servants. Verse 19, and Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, uh, so Joseph, he responds to them, Hey, don't be afraid. Am I in God's place? I'm not. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto God to bring, it, uh, to bring to pass, as it is this day to save much people alive. So Joseph, he says, uh, for you, you thought that you did evil against me, but God, he turned it for something good. And he made it come to pass for this day. Why? For this very reason to save all of you from the famine, which is very true. So verse 21, now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. So Joseph, he tells them, hey, don't be afraid. So don't be afraid. I'm going to take care of you and your children as well. So he comforted them. He was very kind to them. Uh, one of the healings toward bitterness right here, which is very, very difficult to do. I find this very difficult as well. Is Notice right here that Joseph wept when, he, when they said those words to him. Meaning that uh, Joseph... Uh, didn't want to hear that. Isn't that something? Joseph didn't want to hear that. Joseph, uh, he said that it should be, uh, you guys should be able to realize that I've already forgiven you a long time ago, that I'm already good with you. Now, a lot of us, we would rather seek an apology or begging or somebody make up for it, but not Joseph. So I find that very difficult to do. So then, uh, how can I understand that? The only way I can understand that is in Ephesians 4, and we know that standard passage concerning bit bitterness. Go to Ephesians 4. We'll go to Ephesians chapter 4. While you're turning over there, there are some key things that uh, I was able to glean from this where you can heal bitterness. One thing there is no doubt is in verse 20. 
Joseph uh, didn't see them as doing evil against him, but rather God doing it for good. Amen. So one of the healing factors in bitterness is to keep in mind about God is in control. So when this bad thing happened to you, you got to realize that the Lord is using it for a better purpose. Amen, so that's a hard thing, all right? If you don't think that way, if you don't have that much faith in God, then what's going to happen, which is very dangerous, is you're going to turn that bitterness toward God then after that if you're not careful. So it requires a lot of faith, which we see in Joseph's case. we got to realize God is in control, not the evil from others. I'm still getting used to this whiteboard, guys. <laughs> okay, God is in control, not the evil from others. So there must be a lot of faith in this aspect. If you don't have faith, then you're going to have issues. All right, number two. Uh, let's erase this part right here. All right. All right, number two, if we recognize that, it's definitely a death to self. So self is out of the way. Now, in every bitterness, the self cannot be helped but to be thought about during bitterness. So it's always the self that is thought about. All right, what the person did wrong against me. Me, me, me. I demand recompense, etc. Bitterness is a good testing point where you can truly crucify self, yes. where you can truly put to death your flesh. Yes. And then it's about others. Amen. It's easy to care about others and not think about yourself when everything's all right, but what about when things go wrong, when things go bad? So that's an ultimate test where you truly think about others and put to death yourself. Sometimes even the people that you're bitter against, you don't think... Uh, about evil happening to them. But rather, you'd be happy if uh, they were more blessed than you, which is a very hard thing to do, but that's a good test where yourself is really put out of the way and others are truly thought about. Now, number three is Ephesians 4. All right, Ephesians 4. All right. The Bible says in verse 31, let all bitterness, right, be put away from you with all malice. What heals it is verse 32, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. The basis of everything, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So uh, why we can forgive people, why we can overlook the fault of people is because how Christ forgives me. That's so important to think about. Amen. Now, think about this. Joseph is a type of Christ, correct? Yeah. Now, think... Think about this. Get a blessing out of this one. If Joseph is a type of Christ, think about you being those brothers. How many times have we felt guilty about confessing the same sins? How many times have we been fearful? How many times have we thought about God paying us back? But then God's reaction, instead of being upset with us or agreeing with us, is instead tears where he says i'm just sad that you don't realize that i've already forgiven you that i can still use you Amen. Praise God. wow what a wonderful god we serve Amen. now how would i feel after that with that kind of forgiveness if i receive a forgiveness like that That's good. i can do that with other people right. now there's a passage uh, i forgot where it is but the fourth one is this Unless you sensed a much forgiveness, like Jesus said, if you received much forgiveness, then you can forgive much on others. But the person who did not receive much forgiveness, they forgive little as well. So the thing is this, is that it does come down to this concerning bitterness, which is a hard fact, but is Job's case, self-righteousness self-righteousness so the thing is this is that you might think you're humble but to be honest we're not uh, the ultimate test on your humility is bitterness actually 
is when you go through bitterness. When you receive much forgiveness in return, you're able to forgive others much. But if you are used to not, uh, if you're used to receiving little forgiveness because you're all, always been a good person, see, righteous person, then it's easy for you to forgive little as well. So then, how do I resolve this, Pastor? I think you got to spend more time seeing what a dirtbag you are. That will be helpful. Amen. Seeing how wicked, how evil you are. Right. Not on that other person. If you do that, it's easy to compare to Jesus Christ. If you keep concentrating that much, how much of a dirtbag, how much you've hurt him, how much you grieved him, how much you've given him pain, how wicked you are, it'll be easier for you to forgive others after that. So this is uh, one of the healing steps toward bitterness. If you, have, if you find it difficult to overcome bitterness, then sometimes you have to ask yourself in life, is that, have I received much forgiveness in my life? See, when you forgive much, well, when you've been forgiven much, you forgive much on others. But if you are used to receiving little forgiveness because you're such a good guy, a good girl, you know, a big boy, big girl, you know, because you're righteous like Job, but that's the problem, self-righteousness, then you're going to forgive a little. Amen. So it's so important not to look at your self-righteousness, but to look at your crud, if that makes any sense. If you concentrate a lot on that, it'll help a lot when you forgive other people. Really All right. Um, now, uh, we're going to look at verse uh, 20. Uh, and then, uh, yep, we're going to go a little bit over time, but it's okay. Just yeah. a little bit, just a little bit. All right, we're going to finish Genesis here. We can do it. All right. Uh, one of my favorite charts right here. Let's look at this. Okay. So uh, notice the famous passage for Calvinism is in this passage. You, uh, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So Calvinists will claim that this is a passage that is used... Uh, to prove that you're, you don't have free choice. So whatever you do in your life, God is in control. So if you do evil stuff, the Lord was in charge of that. The Lord was in control of that. You have no responsibility. Now, I like this chart, okay? So it's, a, it's called the free will flow chart, okay? So were you physically forced to act? If you go, uh, yes, then your actions were not free. No, then... Could you have done otherwise? So, continuing onward, downward. Yes, no, yes, no. And then it comes down at the end right here. Congratulations, you acted freely right here. <laughs> <laughs> now, believe it or not, this is a passage that would prove more about God's sovereignty at play while at the same time free choice at play. So this is an amazing passage for that one because notice right here in verse 20, ye thought evil, uh, verse 20, but as for you, ye thought evil against me. So notice right here, it's their responsibility, their actions that caused the evil. But notice, but God meant it unto good. So God, through his sovereignty, was able to use it for something good. This is a, a great pass. Uh, this is a great passage that debunks Calvinism, but it also shows how no matter what free choice you make, God's sovereignty will be at play and it will fulfill His purpose. That's the idea. So I don't know how this proves uh, Calvinism. It doesn't prove Calvinism. It just proves more that God's plan will be in play no matter what free choice that you make. Uh, that's a good passage on that one. So it doesn't support. Uh, Calvinism in the slightest. Everyone is accountable for their own actions and their own sins. You can't just all the time uh, blame it on God. You got to realize that these are your actions, these are your choices, this is your free will. But then the Lord, no matter uh, what decisions you make, good or bad, He's going to make sure that His plan will be fulfilled in the end. So that's how strong our God is. All right, uh, one thing to keep in mind uh, concerning Calvinism.
So here are a few notes on Calvinism, then I'll finish up the last verses, and then we'll finish Genesis. All right, a couple things right here. Is that notice in the book of Genesis that their actions, their choices, and actions for the evil that they did. It's not God. Their choices and actions of evil. But notice that God had no part in that, right? On their choices and actions of evil. He didn't do the evil. They did the evil, all right? So that's not, uh, so there's no mention of God forcing them. Number two, uh, we see that no matter what the choice is that is made, whether it be good or bad, whatever choice, whatever choice, it will match up with God's plan. That's the idea. It's like in a game of chess, is that no matter what move that you make in chess, if the person already has a plan on what the person's going to do next, it's not going to ruin his plan. Yeah. Number three is to say that God's sovereignty can only work when a person is forced to do it, then it shows his sovereignty to be weak, actually. So God's sovereignty can only be elevated when, hey, no matter what free choice you make, it will always fulfill my bid and plan, all right? God's sovereignty is elevated when free choice is ongoing as well. So we are more Calvinists than the Calvinists, believe it or not. We elevate God's sovereignty more than the Calvinists. But that's why we demand free will. Free will must be at play. All right? So these are some thoughts to think about that debunks Calvinism, which is very important. Um, the fourth thing that I want to add, and scientists are looking into this, which is very, very interesting, but I'm not going to get too deep into it. But the fourth thing that is at play, uh, let's see right here. The fourth thing that is at play is that, so here are your free choices that you're making over here. And God sees all these alternate planes of choices that everybody makes. God is all-knowing, God is all-present, okay? He can work in any scenario. So because of that, uh, when God has a counsel or will or plan, it's going to meet up every alternate scenario. See that? So it's going to meet up all possible scenarios. So we see right here that God's sovereignty is still at play. God's counsel works with all possible scenario. There's a, uh, this is a side note, but physicists, they're believing that there are uh, nine dimensions, not just three dimensions. And they say in the eighth dimension that there are all possible terrains and fields, actually, that can operate within the universe. Well, God is beyond that, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm actually more Calvinist than those Calvinists. They put him on a, th to put God on a third dimensional plane, yeah. see, he's very amateur. See that? Those scientists recognize, uh, law scientists recognize that it could probably hit the ninth dimension. If we believe God is beyond that, then this can, this can work out well with him, with free choice in all alternate scenarios, while his plan is at play, while he is present still. Yeah. Something interesting there. But anyway, all right, let's wrap this up and then call it a day.
All right, verse 22, And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived an hundred and ten years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you, and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being an hundred and ten years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Okay, so uh, let me show you uh, one last picture here, and then uh, we'll call it a day. Okay, so here's a... So here's uh, one picture uh, that I, about uh, Joseph being buried. So I decided to show that off right here as I wrap things up. Explaining every word from 22 through 26, verse 22. So Joseph lived in Egypt. He, his father's uh, household, Joseph got to live up to 110 years of age. So Joseph was able, in verse 23, to see Ephraim's children up to the third generation. So that's wonderful. Uh, he was able to see the children as well from Macher. Macher is Manasseh's son. And they were brought up upon Joseph's knees. So Joseph was able to uh, play with them. About, uh, they were about knee height. He was sitting on a bed and he was able to bring them up on his knees. That's the idea. Verse 24 Joseph, he says to his brothers, or basically to his family, I think that's the more accurate thing to think about, to his family, hey, I'm going to die. God will surely visit you. He's going to visit you one day. He's going to, uh, he will surely, he, it's for a fact, he's going to get you out of this land of Egypt. And he will get you to the land of Canaan that he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So verse 25, Joseph uh, took a promise from the Jews, from his brethren, his family. And the promise is, God will uh, surely visit you. God will make sure to visit you one day, and you will carry up my bones from Egypt to Canaan. So Joseph died at 110 years of age. They mummified him, and uh, the last thing in your Bible, he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So the Genesis ends with a coffin in Egypt. Uh, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Creation. And then it ends in death. You can't escape that. Second law of thermodynamics. Evolution teaches that uh, from nothing it was created. And then the end result of man is a huge success, life. Uh -huh. No, the, God does the opposite. God says in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it's not from nothing, you know, God created. And the end is mankind at his best is death. Amen. So that's a great way to end in Genesis, showing uh, the best of mankind is just a coffin in Egypt. That's right. uh, just a coffin in Egypt. Starts out well with God, and then it ends with death with man. That's how it's always been in every historical time period and dispensation. But mankind wants to teach you that uh, at the beginning, we came from nothing. That's what they always started out. And at the end, man is successful. <laughs> Jokers, right? Jokers. The Bible is always true while mankind is wrong. Thus, we end our study in Genesis. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for our precious and most holy book. I pray that we've grown in so much knowledge of the scriptures. What an incredible journey it has been through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.